Matt is going to be talking to us later on um, theology. And I'm going to do a reading now. Um, it's from, firstly, the book of Matthew. I'm going to read Matthew verses from chapter 22, verses 23 to 33. And then I'm going to be reading a couple of verses from 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. That same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and third brother, right on down to the seventh. Now finally, the woman died. <laughs> now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? Jesus replied, You are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Then from 2 Timothy. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Uh, morning, everyone. Great to, uh, great to have you with us this morning. Thanks for coming along. So theology. <clears throat> Today I want to talk about uh, theology. And already, having just dropped the T word, I've detected that a lot of people's attention spans have rapidly decreased. And I swear some of you have just looked at your watches. I swear that just happened. <laughs> um, theology is a term that often brings to mind dusty old books, um, only read um, uh, and often only authored by dusty old men, um, uh, or perhaps nerdy young men um, who, uh, who um, squint too much when they're exposed to natural light and have an aversion to team sports. That's the kind of rap that it has, right? Um, theology, it's something, uh, it's a subject that I can't remember the last time they made a Netflix series about it, and I've certainly never like, played a video game that involved it. Sorry, just getting my head around these slides. Um, we'll get back to those. But I need to tell you that theology is the stuff of life. Like opinions, everyone has some kind of theology. You may not be aware of it, but um, according to the definition that I'll be using, you have a theology. You all have some kind of theology. And alongside that, you have a particular way that that theology is put together. So this morning, um, to start this series, in which we'll be looking at some pretty heavy duty theological issues, such as repentance, faith, the Holy Spirit, and maybe even the afterlife, before we kind of tackle all of those, I wanted to look at the art of how we consider all of that stuff, which again, I think you can kind of put under the banner of theology. Today is part one, and with part one, I want to have a look at two key ingredients that go into making up theology. Next week, for part two, I want to have a look at the process, how to actually go about putting our theology together. So to kick off, a definition of theology. What do I mean by the term theology? Uh, I really like this definition by Dallas Willard, um, an author and theologian that a lot of you guys will be familiar with. A theology is only a way of thinking about and understanding or misunderstanding God. And practical theology studies the manner in which our actions interact with God to accomplish his ends in human life. So, Willard maintained that everyone had a practical theology, a way of approaching God. 
both in terms of our thoughts, our attitudes, and our actions. And that altogether, they profoundly influenced or even directed the way that people live. He went as far as to contend that self-identified atheists still had a practical theology. Their way of approaching God was to deny his existence, which obviously had a profound effect on how they went about their lives. So conscious or not, thought out or not, classically Christian or not, everyone has a practical theology, call it a worldview, if you like, that is largely driving how they live. Just like stop and think about this in relation to your own lives, or perhaps in relation to the lives of friends and family. If pressed, I think we'd all be able to tell each other roughly what the point we think of life is, or maybe what a good or ideal existence looks like. And perhaps even more importantly, a bit like Joel was alluding to before, if someone couldn't tell you what they thought that was, they or you, I think, could work it out through watching how that person lived. Our actions, how we actually conduct ourselves, this may be the best sign or indicator of what our practical theology is. Um, I've, I, obviously, in the last couple of weeks, well, in the last week and then the week before, um, there have been a, like a, a couple of tragic early deaths. Um, in our, um, you know, in our nation and further abroad. I think last time I was up here, I alluded to one of my favourite musos dropped dead um, out of the blue a couple of weeks ago, and obviously Shane Warne uh, this week. And you know, you read those eulogies, and people try to make sense of the kind of lives that people lived after they died through those eulogies, don't they? And I say that is trying to kind of, to some degree, articulate what that person who's died, what their theology was. He was a great family man, he was incredibly generous, he was incredibly dedicated to his sport, he took his craft very seriously, etc., etc. That's a form of trying to, again, conceptualise and articulate someone's theology. Some kind of classic questions or issues that, again, help point to our theology are things like, how do we spend our time? How do we spend our money? How do we vote? What do we aspire to? What do we chase after and pursue in life? What are we willing to sacrifice and suffer for? What do, we, what do we tell ourselves we need to happen in order to then be happy? What do we admire? What do we disdain? How do we deal with the inevitable suffering, conflict, malice, sickness and death that life brings? The answers to those questions will be pointers, I'd suggest, towards what our practical theology is. So I've argued that everyone has one, even if you're not aware of it, but that still leaves the issue of how we actually arrive at it. How are we supposed to work out what our theology is? So the rest of this talk is really the start of some ideas. And to give credit where it's due, uh, they mostly come from um, some studies that I've been conducting at Bible College, uh, and particularly through one of my lecturers, Graham Cole. Uh, he's a great Aussie church-based theologian who had a lot of good and helpful stuff to say about this topic. Um, his ideas may not be particularly unique or novel, but his framework was really good and clear. So. First of all, the sources of our theology. What are the key ingredients? And I'd suggest there's two main ones, two main ingredients to our theology. And the first one is scripture, the Bible. We start with the Bible. We believe that God has revealed himself to us, has spoken to us, if you like, through different means, and scripture being the primary one. Um, I should also mention the natural world here too, so the, the, the uh, created order. We know a lot about God through his creation. We know about his creativity. We know about his grandeur. We know about his love of beauty. And the scope of creation can often help us realise just how relatively small and sometimes insignificant we are in the overall scheme of things. It can be really humbling. But I'd also argue that nature is very ambiguous, to say the least. You've got nice nature on the one hand. You've got a beautiful day at Wineglass Bay and my impeccably trained dog, <laughs> right? So that's, well, that's almost Disney, right? That's almost Disney. Nature's so good. Nature, but, then, but then you've got the other side of nature, which is red and tooth and claw. You've got, from what I understand, cuckoo birds and kookaburras that do hideous things to other chicks. And you've got chimp troops whose behaviour can be disarming in all the wrong ways. You've got wild dogs, not just Wilson. Nature can lead you to thinking of Disney movies and a, benevol a benevolent creator. 
but it can also end up looking very much like survival of the fittest. So that's nature. It's got its place, but I still argue the primary way that God discloses himself is through scripture. So we had that classic verse that we heard before, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness. For the person, the person of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And all through the Gospels, particularly at the end, I think of maybe Luke, we hear that Jesus teaches that Scripture, the Old Testament, was all pointing and explaining him. He came to fulfill the Old Testament. Scripture points to Christ. If you want to find out about God, if you're even just curious about God, and if you want to form a theology about God as a Christian, then this is the best place to start. And not only, not only start, but continuously come back to him. But there are a few disclaimers, if you like, or qualifications that need to go along with this. First of all, we need to read scripture with the empowerment and assistance of the Holy Spirit. So I don't want to divide those two together. Scripture, the Bible, needs to be read with the Holy Spirit. Opening it up to us, convicting us, making it a, um, a total, if you like, a total person experience, not just a head exercise. And I'm certainly not saying that we should worship scripture or hold it up in the place of God. Scripture points to and reveals God. And I'm also not suggesting that reading and comprehending Scripture is easy or simple either. Interpreting it is a fraught and often risky affair. But at the same time, the Bible can't be dodged. It can't be placed in the too hard basket if you're a Christian or again even interested in Christianity. If you're curious, if you're at all interested in the person of Jesus, let alone claim to love him, you don't have a better source to find out more about Jesus than Scripture. Scripture itself says that Jesus was a big fan of Scripture, the Old Testament. He was immersed in it. So we saw how he used it in that example when he was debating the, the, uh, the Sadducees before. And of course, another classic example of this is his temptation in the wilderness when he'd been tempted by the devil. Jesus criticizes the Sadducees, one, one group of the religious elite of the day, for their ignorance of, scriptures, of Scripture. He goes back all the way to the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, and says they weren't familiar enough with the Scripture. They didn't know well enough to, have to, to, be, to be able to, to even ask an accurate question. And again, when, when he encounters the devil in the wilderness and is being sorely tempted, he refutes the devil by going back and quoting Scripture. Now, this has led to people referring to Scripture as the norming norm, the norming norm, a bit of a, a, a peculiar phrase, but this is all it means. When it comes to working out our theology, if there's confusion, if there's uncertainty, if there's some contradictions, the norming norm principle says that Scripture has the final say, if you like. If nature, our own intelligence, the prevailing opinion of the day, these should all be taken into account. But if there's any contradiction between them and Scripture, they should all fall under the authority of Scripture. This says that there's a hierarchy when it comes to putting together theology, and Scripture is the top of that. Now, I know that is so easy to say, but so difficult at times to live out. Because let's be honest, there are tough bits, hard bits in the Bible. There's things like the flood and all the millions of people who die. There's the genocide in the Old Testament. There's the cultural norms of the New Testament, slavery, the place of women, stuff like that. And there are different ways to interpret scripture as well, so many ways. And there's the, the, the whole issue of trying to actually unpick and define what it means for, for scripture to be God-breathed, which again, is, it's, not, it's not a simple issue. It's hotly debated, it's, 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 it's contested. But even though there are different ways, so many ways to interpret scripture, so many is not the same as infinite ways, particularly infinite reasonable ways. There are questions that we can ask to try to get at, that, at, at a reasonable conclusion of what scripture means. How have other people gone about it? What's the consensus from people who have spent years of their life studying it, who have got more time to think about it than we do? Again, these aren't easy answers. Two people may say that they both view scripture as the ultimate authority and then reach polar opposite conclusions about an issue. How do you call it between them? 
for example. That's a bigger conversation. But to some degree, I think it's the wrangling with scripture that matters. Have we actually wrestled with the text and prayed for the Spirit's wisdom? Or are we just taking the path of least resistance? Are we just going with what our personality finds comfortable and that interprets the text for us? It's not that noble to be courageously conservative if your default personality is conservative, if it's risk adverse, if it's not really open to new experiences. Just like it's easy to appear broad-minded and generous when your personality is geared towards wanting to be agreeable. Our theology defaulting to our personality type, that's not virtuous. That's not being influenced and transformed by Christ. That's just the path of least resistance. But again, regardless of its challenges, we, and even any serious critic of Christianity, can't ignore the Bible. We've got to grapple with it. Only focusing on our favourite proof texts and passages or dismissing, or dismissing it wholesale. They're both cop-outs. And I think this really matters for a whole bunch of reasons, but I'm sure I can't be the only one in this room who knows people who have effectively given up the faith because they ran up against what they thought were just intractable issues with the scripture, couldn't work out a way to interpret it, got bogged down and left the whole thing behind. And if they'd, I think, if they'd just prayed about it more, if they'd read the right people more, they could have found answers there. They could have found answers. So, there's a challenge there. I know it's difficult. But at the same time, having Scripture as the norm of norms is also comforting. Because if Scripture wasn't the norm, the norming norm, what else would be? It would fall down to our limited experience. It might be the prevailing opinion of our age with all its blind spots and biases. There's got to be some final authority that makes the, like the, the end call when it comes to working out our theology. So scripture, that's the first important ingredient. Uh, but that's not all. We've got one more. And that's in doing our theology, we can look to those who have gone before us. So we consult tradition. We listen to those who God has obviously gifted with wisdom and the gift of understanding communicating and even applying scripture. And again, this is such a useful safeguard against our ignorance, our biases, our chronological snobbery, our being stuck in being people of our own age. Um, having to study, I've, had, I've been kind of forced to read a long, um, like a list of long time dead Christian greats. And it was so illuminating to read those guys, those people. First of all, you take almost any current theological issue or debate and guaranteed it's been thrashed out, it's been talked about, it's been discussed multiple times beforehand and often really thrashed out, as in people have spilled blood over getting to what they thought the truth was and defending it. People have given their lives to it. It's amazing. There is really nothing new underneath the sun. And then there's the issue of sometimes thinking that people in the past couldn't possibly relate to us. What are people like, what are a whole bunch of, you know, guys who have been dead thousands of years, hundreds of years, what could they possibly have to say for us? They were so different back then. It's so easy to stereotype people of the past. For example, what would those crusty old church fathers, what would they know about the temptations that young people face today? You know, those saints wouldn't be able to relate to the perils of online porn or hookup culture or Tinder. They were too busy fasting 24-7. But then you come across someone like St. Augustine and his famous prayer, Lord, deliver me from lust, but not yet. <laughs> That's such, such an all too human prayer, right? All too human prayer, deliver me from lust, but not yet. Augustine, who before his conversion was a wild living playboy. Not that different from a lot of people today. So our theology, it should be informed by those long dead and gone because they may have actually been smart and gifted in discerning and interpreting scripture. And because in the most important ways, they actually aren't that much different from us. God uses people from the past to help us in the present. So they're the two elements or basic ingredients of theology. But then there's a the process. How do we actually go about putting those together? And that'll be next week's talk. So let me finish with some practical suggestions for wrangling with scripture. Because again, I don't think this can be emphasized too much. 
as far as I know, in multiple um, studies that they've run with Christian populations over the long term, the best indicator of likely long-term spiritual development and growth among Christians is daily Bible reading, just daily Bible reading. That's like, if you like, the cornerstone, keystone, fundamental habit, just daily time immersed in scriptures. But again, it's often easier said than done. So here's a couple of options. First of all, consider just going through different versions. This is, this is uh, the message, the entire message Bible, Old Testament and New Testament by Eugene Peterson. It's like the classic paraphrase. If you spend a lot of time with your NIV or your ESV, it doesn't help, it doesn't hurt, sorry, to dive into this once in a while because the language is so different and so immediately accessible, albeit with a couple of kind of 70s and 80s references, I think. But other than that, it's good. Or you can go to the complete other end of the spectrum. This is a translation of the Gospels, um, I think from last year, by a Quaker, a Quaker scholar. And it is meant to be um, gnarly and clunky. The language, to some degree, is so unuser friendly it's still English, right? But it stops you in your tracks. And it makes you reassess what you're reading. It kind of helps defamiliarize the text for you, which can be such a good thing. Consider books to read about how to read the Bible. This is a classic, how to read the Bible for all it's worth, probably like in its 20th edition by now, it's been around for that long, but for good reason. This talks about things like genre, Old Testament versus New Testament, you know, um, gospel versus letters, that kind of thing. So it's just a great way to get more, if you like, insight from, again, people who God has, has gifted about how to understand and appreciate the Bible. A lot of us aren't readers so much as listeners. There's audio versions, obviously, now that you can get to the Bible. This is a classic, this one here. Johnny Cash reads the complete New Testament in the old King James Version. JC reading about JC. It's great. It's good. It's fantastic. I mean, it's 16 CDs if you've got a CD player, but you can probably get it like MP3 versions. But that's like another, another way of, again, of just soaking yourself in Scripture, listening to it. And, of course, there's multiple podcasts that do the rounds now. You can have one in the background that, again help inform you how to better appreciate the Bible. Uh, this is one that I've been listening to recently um, by uh, an Aussie theologian, Michael F. Bird. He's a contemporary of um, N.T. Wright. They've co-authored a couple of books together. He's a big brain. He's a fantastic lecturer. Um, and he just put together this book and a podcast that goes with it. It's got a bit of an unfortunate title, Seven Things I Wish Christians Knew About the Bible. But again, seven podcast episodes, seven pretty easy chapters, just if you like debunking or explaining, getting around some of the common pitfalls that we fall into when it comes to reading scripture. So lots of good, lots of good options. I mean, Christian or not, this is going back to the last big point. It's worth asking, is your theology something you've given much conscious thought to at all? Again, if it helps, go under a different name. Have you thought about your worldview? Have you thought about your, your guiding philosophy? And if you have, is it working out for you? That is, is your current theology, particularly your practical theology, is that leading to a good life? And by a good life, I mean one that is full of the good, the beautiful, and the true. Is it paying off in that regard? Because it should, right? It should. If it's a good theology, it should bear good fruit. And if it's not, what needs tweaking? We've all got a practical theology, and it matters. There's a great quote. I'm not sure who do we kind of originally attribute it to, but it goes... We don't so much possess ideas as much as ideas possess us. We don't so much possess ideas as ideas possess us. There's an idea, there's a worldview, there's a practical theology that is orienting and animating all our lives. And it's worth dragging it out into the light and examining it, seeing what makes it up and asking how it's working out. Okay, let me pray. Father, I thank, you for, um, I thank you for scripture. I thank you for your word. Uh, I thank you, as people have already mentioned this morning, it's been around for so long, uh, it endures. It constantly adds, um, constantly adds wisdom and guidance and value to our life. And it also always points back to you. I pray particularly um, that we'll do the hard work, even though when it's difficult and, um, and sometimes an, an arduous task, help us persist with your spirit's help in trying to mine the Bible for all it's worth, to understand it, to appreciate it, to let it form us into the people who you'd have us be. And I pray that we won't be snobbish about that, Father. Um, help us not just be completely captivated by what's new and hip 
and cutting edge, but help us have the humility to dive back into the past and to again um, access and listen to, consider the people who you've gifted. Help us um, and help us do this with each other, Father. Thank you for community. Thank you again that this is a, this is a task, um, our faith, constructing our theology. It doesn't lie with us alone as individuals, but it's something that you've called us to do together. Amen.